Thank you, Grant. Um, uh, one thing that Grant Underwood didn't say at the beginning is that I've been following Grant for a long time. <laughs> you might have gotten that from some of our, uh, the, the bio, but um, it's always a pleasure and an honor. Um, but Grant actually helped to hire me at the University of North Carolina all those many years ago. And uh, he was a tough act to follow, in fact, um, when he left. He handed off to me a course. He taught a course with two to 300 students every year. He handed it off to me before he left. And I said, Grant, I can't tell jokes like you can tell jokes. Um, I don't have that touch. And uh, somehow I muddled through, but um, I'm always appreciative of hearing him and hearing his wisdom. I also want to thank uh, Spencer and Craig and Jeremy, who helped with the video stuff. And who else? Carl, who shepherded us around campus. Um, for having us here and for making our stay so hospitable. Thank you. And finally, I just want to say that after this morning's session, those of you who were not here uh, for this morning's papers really missed a treat. Um, I feel like this is a pro seminar in lectures. Um, I've learned a lot uh, from people who I've long admired. So it's a, a great pleasure to be here. I know Jeremy told me how this works. I just have to. Okay. Just two weeks ago, over Labor Day weekend, a Utah-based group called The Remnant gathered in Boise, Idaho. The Remnant consists of an estimated eight to 10,000 followers of a man named Denver Snuffer. Until several, several years ago, Snuffer was a faithful member of the LDS community who had grown increasingly dissatisfied with the church hierarchy, insisting that true Mormon tradition must be excised of the many impurities to his way of thinking that had crept in over time. This included, most notably, the removal of doctrines regarding church organization, priesthood offices, and polygamy, as well as a thoroughgoing reinterpretation of foundational Mormon texts. A prolific author and public speaker, Snuffer came into conflict with church teachings through the challenges he posed to LDS doctrine in his 2011 publication, Passing the Heavenly Gift. Because of his views and his eagerness to bring others around to his way of thinking, and specifically because of his refusal to cease distribution of the book, which was growing increasingly popular in select LDS circles, he was excommunicated in 2013. Over this past Labor Day weekend, a sizable gathering of the remnant convened in Boise in what was billed as the Doctrine of Christ Conference. According to the group's press release, the renegade Mormon faction advocated, quote, a new tide of open religious thought and worship that is highly individual. The faithful in this new school of thought believe that God is capable of revealing his word to anyone who earnestly seeks it. And when truth is discovered, it should be added to the canon of inspired writings." Unquote. At their meeting, the remnant in Idaho officially canonized new versions of LDS texts, including a revised Book of Mormon and a curated version of the Doctrine and Covenants. Now, whatever one thinks of the remnant message, no one would have more heartily approved of the spirit of this new venture than Martin Luther. He would have smiled on the emphasis on individual religious thought and discernment, and he would have applauded the certainty that God would explicate his word to those who earnestly seek it. When he was called before the imperial diet in 1521, some four years after his initial foray into social media publishing on the door of the Wittenberg church, or the bulletin board, as we heard this morning, it might not have been a church after all, so you've you know, blown all of my uh, preconceptions about the Reformation. Luther invoked the authority of scripture to override the dictates of the church. Quote, unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of the popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. Actually, Jennifer quoted the same passage in her talk this morning. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me, amen, unquote. Rejecting the dictates of a hierarchy that cautioned about the dangers of individual and unmediated interpretation of holy texts, 
Luther instead implored his followers to read the scriptures and study them regularly as a guide to God's truth. The foundational problem with the Catholic Church, among its many other flaws, included the neglect of scripture. Again, not the banning of scripture as we learned this morning, but the neglect of scripture as he saw it, which he characterized as one of the greatest evils in the world. The Bible was a book not just to know in a cognitive sense, but to wrestle with daily and persistently. Quote, there has never been an art or a book on earth that everyone has so quickly mastered as the Holy Scriptures, but its word are, words are not, as some think, mere literature, in German, lesewort, literature. They are words of life, lebewort, intended not for speculation and fancy, but for life and action. Life and action, a conscience captive to the word of God. Luther, of course, became well known for his devotion to the principle of sola scriptura, his reliance on the authority of the text as a guide to salvation. As he explained it, quote, a simple layman armed with scripture is greater than the mightiest pope without it, unquote. Where Luther might well have balked, however, was at the remnant's final dictum. Remember what they said, when truth is discovered, it should be added to the canon of inspired writings, unquote. For the 16th century reformer, the Bible as already written down was the final word. Human beings should read it, interpret it, even wrestle with it. But he would have drawn a sharp distinction between reinterpretation and addition. Scriptures could not be added to the biblical text because the book itself represented God's complete and perfect revelation to humanity. Now I'd like to suggest today that that conceptual distinction between praying over and discerning the Bible's meaning and transforming its message altogether was never entirely possible and it just got harder and harder as time went on. Once Luther and his compatriots helped to unleash ordinary people on the Bible or perhaps unleash the Bible on the people, it became increasingly difficult to stem the impulse to scripturalize, to play with, amend, and add new texts to the corpus. In fact, the line between translation, the lines between translation, interpretation, and complete revision got very, very blurry. His legacy spawned not simply a reformation of the holy book itself, but of the relationship between the individual and that text. And that shift, in turn, led to the effusion of new practices of reading, of praying, and of writing. Now, nowhere was this transformation of scripture, changes in its format, its use, its pervasiveness, and its offshoots, more notable or significant than in the United States. We only have to look around us, or to go online today, to recognize the myriad editions and interpretations of the Bible that have grown out of this captivity to scripture. We might look, for example, at the American Patriots Bible. Published by the giant Christian company Thomas Nelson, the American Patriots Bible interweaves patriotic facts, quotations, and, and pictures with the scriptural text to illustrate how the Bible connects the US nation, specifically, to God's revealed word. So the book of Numbers, uh, in uh, tw chapter 12, verse seven, in the book of Numbers, the Lord's statement that Moses, quote, is faithful in all my houses, calls for a boxed quote from Grover Cleveland about how the teachings of Christ, quote, results in the purest patriotism, unquote. At other points, the words of Thomas Jefferson, Douglas MacArthur, and Dick Cheney are invoked to explain the meaning of the text for the American reader. Now, for a minute, I'll pick on the other end of the spectrum, <laughs> the political spectrum, just being even-handed here. A second example of a newer Bible edition is the Green Bible from HarperCollins Publishers, which promotes caring for the earth as both a calling and a lifestyle by placing pertinent parts of the text in green ink. Its pages are made of 10% post-consumer recycled paper. The words are printed with soy-based ink and the binding is 100% cotton and linen. Green Bible readers encounter an impressive role of liberal Protestant contributors, each offering a sermon or article on some aspect of creation care. One is called Reading the Bible Through a Green Lens, another Knowing Our Place on Earth, Learning Environmental Responsibility from the Old Testament. 
Uh, those are examples, and of course, Archbishop Desmond Tutu supplies a foreword to this book. Now, both of these editions, of course, appeal to some of our less admirable qualities, the desire to gear religion to the needs of the marketplace, and a fervent wish to have scripture tell us the very things we already believe to be true about ourselves and our God. Yet they also speak to a willful surrender to the captivity of the word, as Luther would have it. American Protestants love their Bibles to own, to search for guidance, and to individualize. No edition better signals both this reverence for scripture and the desire to see our own values reflected back at us in the holy book than does the personal promise Bible. Sold online in multiple editions, including a leather-bound, gold-embossed version with your name on the cover for $129, the personal promise Bible is advertised as a book, quote, as unique as you. And to give you an example of what you can expect, I present here a sample edition for you. I took the liberty of typing in the name of someone well known to some of you around BYU and received these sorts of passages. Um, so in John 1.12, we have Spencer Fluman is God's son. It inserts Spencer's name at every turn through the Bible. Um, so this, these are all from the book of John, but there are pages and pages it generates. <laughs> Oh, so Spencer, I, I have the rest of your Bible waiting for you, and I take checks. So. <laughs> now, let me be very clear. I'm not mocking any of these expressions of faith. So if you have a personal promise Bible in your house, I am not meaning to mock this. Although sometimes the marketing uh, pointedly reflects the needs of publishers looking to make a buck. But the very existence of these multiple editions signifies a deeply felt need and an orientation to the Holy Scriptures that is distinctively Protestant in origin and which took on new life in the American context. The combination of religious orientation toward a personal encounter with the text combined with a free market religious economy proved to be a potent mix that ignited an outpouring of edited editions and even new Bibles. Perhaps the, best, or the, well, the most well-known example of this additive feature, and certainly on this campus, and some of you may have already anticipated where I'm going with this story, came in the emergence of the Book of Mormon. But Joseph Smith, Jr. was not alone in this. Many other Americans creatively engaged with biblical texts before and after he translated his golden plates. I'll come back to him later. I hope to exp explain briefly first how the Reformation paved a path from the doctrine of sola scriptura to a society of American scripturalists who felt fully emboldened both to proclaim the absolute authority of the text on the one hand and simultaneously to revise it. The United States became a society both where the Bible in the singular reigned supreme and where Bibles in the plural flourished in all corners. Now, by way of background, we need to keep in mind that the Bible has never been a single nor a stable text. So if we spent this morning uh, deconstructing the Reformation, I'm going to spend just a little time deconstructing the, the idea of the Bible as stable. Creating the scriptural corpus in the first place was a centuries-long process, one that involved not only editing and compiling the various manuscripts that would comprise the Holy Scriptures, but deciding which ones were authoritative and putting them in a material form. The earliest Christians, for example, adopted the Jewish scripture, scriptures as their own and only gradually came to incorporate books of what would become the New Testament into their communal life. Martian of Sinope was perhaps the first follower to designate a given body of texts as a Christian canon, circa 160 CE. He proposed the compilation of 10 epistles of the Apostle Paul that had been circulating among Christian communities, along with parts of the Gospel of Luke, into an official Christian gospel. Not long after that, Irenaeus proposed a four-gospel canon. By the fourth century, the Western Church had settled on a limited group of books for the New Testament that articulated what they considered an orthodox set of beliefs. But even then, the Bible was hardly set in stone. Many apocryphal texts, those religious writings considered valuable but not universally accepted as part of the canon, circulated among various Christian groups. The major divisions of the church that existed by the 16th century, Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant, 
disagreed on the inclusion of a number of documents, and each moved in turn to declare their canons complete and closed. Textual heterogeneity, then, was the norm long before Luther came on the scene. Even when early churches were able to agree on which texts to include, new questions arose about design and language translation. Bibles in the medieval period contained a chaotic sprawl of words and images presented in a variety of formats. And church leaders, although they had prescribed the texts contained within the canon, had never dictated their order or prescribed any standardized formatting or punctuation. I often ask my students, what would you do if you took all the books of the Bible and mixed them up into a different order? How would your reading experience of that book be different? Now, granted, most people don't read the Bible from end to end, uh, certainly not in one sitting or even a few, but the idea is that these books were not, you know, from the beginning placed in the order in which we now find them. Scribes, therefore, had little guidance as they created new copies, a situation that led to creativity and variety, from psalm books to personalized, illuminated scriptures. And often pragmatic fig, uh, concerns figured just as largely as did doctrinal ones. Uh, so I have an example here of uh, a Paris Bible. They were known as the Paris Bibles from the 13th century that are designed for portability because these were carried by members of itinerant Catholic orders, and they needed books that they could carry around with them. And so this provided sort of one kind of standardization of sort of a small book. But it was precisely because they needed those small ones that they got them that way. The financial demands of wealthy donors also encouraged the personalization of Bibles as a means of engaging support as well as promoting personal piety. So if you think the personal promise Bible is a new phenomenon, you are wrong. And we had wealthy donors who would have these scribes put themselves, put the, the donors, into the margins of the manuscripts um, in order to, it, it was in effect to promote personal piety, um, as is the personal promise Bible. Now, one might well assume that this multiplication of Bible versions was only a cosmetic concern, a matter of placing the same content between different covers for all to see. But textual formatting, and especially translation, were understood to be intimately related to scriptural interpretation. And they were political as well as religious activities that figured largely in the immediate lead up to the Reformation. In the 15th century, the Archbishop of Canterbury banned the biblical translation of John Wycliffe, a Catholic dissident, for precisely that reason. It was feared that Wycliffe's heretical views would be transmitted in his interpretive choices. For the medieval church, only the authorized Latin Vulgate edition of the Bible could adequately capture the truth of Christianity, and the church jealously protected its hold on its transmission. To do so, England, by 1408, had enacted the strict, strictest religious censorship laws in Europe, outlawing all unauthorized translations. Wycliffe, along with a number of other ambitious translators who defied the church's warnings, was summarily burned at the stake for this offense. Now let this be a, a lesson to any language majors out there. I know BYU is known for its language study. Uh, be careful what you translate and who you give it to. <laughs> the hunger to make the Bible one's own burst into flames after Luther's highly public stand. Within the growing Protestant communities in Europe and the Americas by the 1600s, the impulse to translate the Bible into local languages, into the vernacular, as Jennifer spoke about earlier, to bring the Bible to the people, further multiplied the choices made by individual artists, scholars, rulers, and publishers as they created new versions of the text. As the scholar Lori Farrell has demonstrated, quote, every act of scriptural translation in this era was an act of biblical interpretation essentially religious at its core, and thus unfailingly political in its effects." Unquote. Controlling the Bible was a means of controlling the church. And as reformers stood their ground across Europe against the emperor, they also had to deal with outbursts of even more radical enthusiasm. It was one thing to encourage translation or reinterpretation of the original texts, but it was a slippery slope from that translation to addition and supplementation through new revelation. One by one, communitarian and millennial groups 
of what came to be called the Radical Reformation, Hutterites, Musserites, Battenbergers, Amish, and Mennonites among them. You'll find them all in Sidney Alstrom's textbook, by the way. I think he talks about almost every single one of them. Um, it, these groups were inspired by Luther's call to claim the scriptures, rejected the very reformers that had initiated religious change in the first place. Most of them wrote profusely and published broadly, evincing the Protestant captivity to the word while changing its form and message. For all of this practical diversity, or as the Catholics called it, chaos, uh, for all this diversity then, almost all Protestants oriented themselves toward sacred texts in very similar ways. They were all in the business of establishing a purer scripture than their neighbors had. The Puritans, as, as it turned out, were not the only migrants to the New World who declared a wholehearted commitment to the authority of the Bible. Yet that authority took on decidedly different forms in different places. The radical pietist Johann Conrad Beisel arrived in Pennsylvania in 1720, where he became a member of the Schwarzenau Brethren, a group that had broken away from the Lutheran Church in 1708. Beisel became a charismatic but controversial leader who was seen by his followers as having spiritual gifts, such as prophecy and healing. During the 70 years the community flourished, it produced a large body of poetry, art, music, and theological treatises. Like other Protestants, the Afreda community, as Beisel's followers came to be known, believed in the purity and sufficiency of the Bible. Their theology, a hybrid of pietism and mysticism, encouraged celibacy, Sabbath worship, and the ascetic life's life. The community became especially notable, though, for its production of texts in its complete publishing center, including a paper mill, printing office, and book bindery. Eventually, it boasted the largest German language press in the colonies. In the newly formed United States, it was that common approach to the Bible, not a common interpretation of its contents, that made possible the novel combination of denominational diversity and national unity extolled by Protestant leaders in the early years of the 19th century. This is that evangelical synthesis that Grant just talked about. We see in images such as this one from about 1845 a focus on unity as nine representatives from various Christian churches meet around the Bible. Such union makes possible the lion and lamb lying down together in front of them. Now this image for Americans contrasted sharply with the bloody religious battles recently fought in Europe. Here in the United States, they suggested, the final reconciliation can take place. We have a common Bible with different churches. This is the essence of denominational pluralism. Now note too, um, who's left out of this unity around the book. There uh, is um, an African slave up in the right-hand corner and a Native American up in the left-hand corner, and that I'll leave that uh, as a talk for another day. As if to sacralize this place as a land of biblical unity, Protestant Americans also christened the landscape with place names that invoked their textual foundations. Babel, oh, sorry. Babylon, Canaan, Goshen, Damascus, Gilead, Jordan, Scripture was marked on the landscape in ways that implied a biblical unity among its people and a link to a sacred past. What's notable here, though, is that most of those names were conferred during the 19th century in moments of intense conflict over slavery, westward expansion, and immigration. So their, de their demarcation said as much about the tensions brewing within the country and the anxieties around national identity as they did about religious unity. This surface unity, kept in place by a Protestant establishment that had increasing social and economic power in the, eight, in the 1800s, also downplayed deep practical and theological fissures. Even as the Bible helped connect Protestant Americans to one another and to a biblical past, it also encouraged new uses of scripture. In the heady and tumultuous decades of the early 19th century, many Americans sought religious truths that would help them make sense of this new republic and allow them to communicate their understandings to others. Sacred texts that would both connect them to their predominantly Christian past and take them into an uncertain future proved a remarkably potent way of expressing and transforming faith 
and of wedding the twin imperatives of stability and flexibility. Uh, writings as diverse, I'm just going to give you a, a list here. I don't have time to talk about them much here. I'll get back to the Book of Mormon in 1830. The Shaker's Holy, Sacred, and Divine Role in Book from 1843. James Colin Brewster's A Warning to the Latter-day Saints, 1845. Andrew Jackson Davis's Principles of Nature, 1847. Ellen White's The Great Controversy, 1858. Mary Baker Eddy's Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, 1875 and John Ballou Newbro's Ohaspi, a Cosmon Bible in the words of Jehovah and his angel ambassadors from 1882. All of these books claim to extend or complete the promises of the Bible. Many of these new scriptures caught the attention of believers willing to commit themselves to the truth of their teaching. In other words, the Bible was, for all intents and purposes, up for grabs. We've seen then how American Protestants inherited two somewhat contradictory elements of the reformers' approach to scripture. On the one hand, a reverence for the unifying power of the text through the practice of interpretation. On the other, the atomizing tendencies inherent in the intense focus on the power of personal discernment. That focus on individual discernment was amplified by the separation of church and state in the US a disestablishment that gave free reign to groups that could draw on biblical unity while spreading their new messages. Governments in Europe, in contrast, generally had an easier time regulating the distribution of authorized Bible editions. We've already mentioned England. England, where the magisterial King James Version had remained the standard of the church since its introduction in the early 17th century, could well have been described as a country that knew what the Bible was because the crown countenanced only one official version. In the United States, however, the unyoking of church from state after the American Revolution threw wide the doors to all manner of scriptural transformation and dissemination. If no Bible version was orthodox anymore, none could be categorically censored as heretical either. A third feature of the US that served to magnify the reformers' scripturalizing impulses came in the form of industrial and technological change. Now, one might assume that just as Gutenberg's printing press had made possible the replication of the biblical text, the new technologies of the 19th century might temper, if not resolve, the problem of the dazzling variety of biblical interpretations that had sprung up in the early nation. I think part of the goal, uh, the hope there, is that replication will lead to standardization. If you can replicate something, you can preserve a, a particularly pure form of it. By 1850, American ingenuity had put the Bible into mass production and made available copies of Christian scripture for ever larger communities, so that the United States was certainly the most Bible-saturated nation on earth. This was due to a combination of new technologies beginning in the 1810s, including the advent of the power printing press, machine-made paper, new binding techniques, and enhanced distribution strategies. Energetic organizations like the American Bible Society, founded in 1860, and probably the same men that you saw up there standing around the Bible before were the type of men who headed up the American Bible Society, they dedicated themselves to placing a copy of the Bible in the hands of every American. While changes in social values, such as a rising literacy rate and access to educational opportunities among middle class citizens, expanded the reading population across the country. All of these factors led to enormous growth in the number and variety of Bibles available to average Americans. Publishers, catalyzed by the growth of markets, began in the 1820s to produce illustrated Bibles. So here's the Harper's Illuminated Bible, versions with maps and articles on the Holy Land and other specialized details to distinguish their products. In trying to unite Americans around the good book, Bible peddlers and producers led to the further proliferation of scriptural variations and a waning common sense of what constituted the Bible itself. In fact, Harper's Bible, as did but some of you may, may have come across these in your own houses or grandparents' houses, Bibles where you actually record your own family history within the pages of the Bible itself, another way of personalizing your Bible. Despite the growing numbers of Bible editions, and without a state church to regulate and control an authorized version of Holy Writ, Americans seemed less and less sure of what the book in its essence was, even as they clamored for more of it. The Bible, in short, for all its enormous popularity, had also become a huge problem 
for American Christians by the mid-19th century. While the cadences of the King James Version echoed throughout the land, and the book as a religious object was revered and protected in public schools and courthouses, it would have been difficult to find any agreement about what the Bible looked like, since many of its versions, so many versions were available, exactly what it said, since its conformity to history and science began to become very confusing. The Bible had enormous importance and influence, to be sure, but what was it? And what verifiable evidence did believers have for its authority as a sacred text? The purity and unity of the text seemed ever more elusive. It was no accident then that in a society in which the Bible was invested with tremendous cultural power but simultaneously was increasingly contested, religious innovators stepped in with new interpretations, commentaries, and even additions to Christian scripture. The earliest scriptural innovator in the new nation was the founding father Thomas Jefferson himself, who was known to have kept next to him on his bedstand a copy of the Bible that he had personalized by cutting and pasting the passages of the New Testament that he found both believable, as in, for him, non-miraculous, and ethically inspiring. But many others would soon follow. They included Joseph Smith, Jr., who claimed to have discovered ancient golden plates in a hillside in the 1820s that he then translated with the aid of divine revelation. A host of spiritualists who channeled the communication, communications of deceased spirits through their writings. Mary Baker Eddy, who founded the Church of Christ Scientists on the basis of her inspired discovery of scientific religious principles. And a dozen or more extra biblical gospels or lives of Jesus that sought to explain and amplify aspects of the earthly history of the Nazarene prophet. These diverse texts, many of which became scripture to a variety of American religious communities, asserted authority in divergent ways. Some were presented as ancient texts, newly discovered or revealed. Others came through inspiration, revelation, or channeled communication, declaring they recovered old truths or revealed new meanings to ancient tales. But what connected all of these texts is the linkage they claimed, either explicitly or implicitly, to some aspect of the Bible itself. They borrowed cultural authority from the Bible to stake their own claim to religious value and to convince a biblically literate reading public of their importance. Now in claiming that God and Jesus had appeared to him and instructed him, Joseph Smith Jr. was hardly an aberration in his time and place although the leaders of the local Protestant churches were clearly not amused. He was the most successful of a plethora of American religious entrepreneurs who used the Bible and practice of scripturalization to bring believers into a community. But he provided something that most other religious entrepreneurs lacked. He had visible material evidence of divine intervention, or at least he had testimony to material evidence of divine in in intervention. He had a book that he insisted he had translated from golden plates provided by an angel. Beyond dreams and visions then, and no matter how one evaluated it, he presented empirical evidence for his assertions. The existence of the Book of Mormon confirmed what many Americans had previously believed, that dreams, visions, and visitations by angels were a vital and continuing part of Christian life. Joseph Smith Jr.'s parents described years of meaningful dreams before the advent of the events surrounding the Book of Mormon, and in this they were hardly alone. Many early followers breathlessly recounted the story of the initial angelic visitation of Moroni and his insistent reappearance to multiple witnesses as evidence of their faith. It was this living story of miraculous heavenly encounter, most notably demonstrated by the Book of Mormon, which astonished early followers. Joseph Smith promised his followers that they too would be endowed with power and be visited by angels. They too would receive answers to prayer, would speak in tongues, and would be healed, as in the days of the early apostles. See, he implied, it's all right there in the Bible. For his early followers, as Terrell Givens has asserted, what the book, the Book of Mormon, symbolized was arguably more important than the content of the book itself. In fact, many of the first church members had not even read the book before joining the new church. The existence of the book, its compositions at the hands of Joseph Smith, Jr., God's new prophet, signaled the advent of a new era, the final epic in sacred history. 
Early missionaries of the young church described, quote, preaching the Book of Mormon, by which they meant not interpreting stories contained within the text, but preaching about the truth of the book as a sign of God's intervention in history. The golden plates were only the beginning of many prophecies to come. Through the translation of the text, God was announcing to the faithful that divine power was once again restored to the earth and that the gospel promises would all be fulfilled. Like the prophets of the ancient world, Joseph Smith would lead the Mormons as they gathered together and reestablished Zion, God's kingdom, on earth. The book as a sign also altered the way that believers understood sacred history and time itself. Rather than relying on one revealed text, the Bible, for complete understanding of God's plan, the existence of the Book of Mormon implied, and the narrative itself stated, that there were many records still to be discovered. Citing the 29th chapter of the Book of Isaiah, early believers argued that the whole truth of the scriptures had been purposely withheld from ordinary people in a deliberate conspiracy against democratic access to God's record. Again, echoes of the reformers' calls. This explained for some people why the faithful were so roundly persecuted. As Mormon leader Parley Pratt suggested, they were attempting to take for themselves a power and divine message that others sought to withhold. God was once again speaking to his people, and the canon of scripture had therefore been reopened. Revelations would continue to pour forth from Joseph Smith, Jr. regarding the truths that God wanted restored to the earth. Scripture itself thus became a malleable and continuous record rather than a fixed text. The Book of Mormon promised this, but it also symbolized in material form the restoration of the correct divine human relationship. Further, it meant that the doctrines of the church, the teachings of its prophets, could be added incrementally or even changed over time. Put within the framework of this larger history of scripture then, Mormon novelty relied on a widely shared belief in the eternal verities of the Bible. The Book of Mormon may have revealed new eras of sacred history, but it could not have existed at all without the biblical text and the problems that had arisen from the hold that text had on the minds of everyday Americans. So the Book of Mormon was a problem uh, that had been created by the Bible itself, or the answer to a problem, excuse me. Early Mormons were also not wrong to blame much persecution against them on the basis of their novel claims about scripture. The vast majority of Protestants in upstate New York heaped nothing but scorn on the enterprise, mocking Joe Smith's gold Bible. To many, the book was an unsophisticated and clearly unsubstantiated sequel to the holy book. Quote, the book is chiefly garbled from the Old and New Testaments, the apocryphy having contributed its share, announced the Painesville, Ohio Telegraph in March of 1831, describing a fake in which biblical, quote, names and phrases have been altered and in many instances copied upwards. The very closeness of the Book of Mormon to the Bible and the claims it made upon that text are what led to much anger and conflict. Yet Protestants, for all of their anger, had no legal grounds on which to declare the Book of Mormon heretical. So they took matters, some of them, into their own hands and settled for vigilante justice to protect the borders around their own holy book. Now, obviously, Mormon persecution related to so much more. But we're missing a large piece of the picture if we do not see its emergence as a viable movement and its contentiousness as an outgrowth of the very scriptural processes from which it had come processes unleashed by the new approach to scripture that emerged in the 16th century and fueled by social structures in the United States that encouraged and facilitated it. But even for Mormons, who established safeguards in a hierarchical structure to control their own scriptural process, as had Protestant groups before them, reforming impulses could not be entirely contained. The process continued almost immediately in the claims of 14-year-old James Colin Brewster, whose family had moved to Kirtland, Ohio to join with the Mormons when James was a young boy. In 1837, the 10-year-old claimed that he had been visited by an angel who had shown him a better way to organize Joseph Smith's church. Initially encouraged in his spiritual precocity by church leaders, I'm sure they saw him as just a, a very cute and smart young boy as part of the movement, but instead, his continuing corrections, Brewster's continuing corrections to church teachings, eventually caused a rift with Mormon leaders, 
and his family, while still connected to the faith, moved to Springfield, Illinois. From there, Brewster began in 1842 to publish pamphlets that he asserted were abridgments of ancient documents furnished by the angel. Collectively called the Book of Esdras, Brewster claimed that they were the teachings of an ancient biblical prophet who lived in approximately 160 BCE. The publications contained many predictions related to the fate of the larger Mormon community, criticized the emergence of Mormon temple ceremonies and Mormon economic practices, and prophesied the end of the world in 1878. Brewster and his family were excommunicated in 1842, but this hardly stopped his production of texts, or uh, the, I should say the fervor of at least a small group of followers that eventually picked up and followed him uh, on the road to California, where they were going to settle down and, and start their own movement. Denver Snuffer's claims, then, represent part of a much longer process, a scripturalization and containment that has characterized Protestantism throughout American history. Now the remnant, in fact, has undertaken the canonization of its own newly created text. So I think of it sometimes as sort of pulling up the drawbridge after you as you come onto the, you know, across the moat. We love our Bibles as these statistics suggest. And you get, these are recent statistics. Uh, you get to see a, uh, n the number of translations of the New Testament in the entire Bible. Um, ownership of the Bible, how many people have Bibles in American households, how many uh, Bibles they typically own, and what they call the most popular book of all time, Chairman Mao's quotations are still vying. I think as long as the, the number of people in China is larger than that in the U.S., then that number might stay larger. But, um, but we love our Bibles, as these statistics suggest, and we love trying to capture that text and contain it. Hence, we see memorialization of the Bible in at least eight museums around the country, including the 430,000 square foot Museum of the Bible scheduled to open this November, two blocks from the National Mall in Washington, D.C. Since the Reformation, then, Protestants and their heirs have been captive to the Bible in more ways than one, captive to its elusiveness, captive to its uncontainability. As at least one Mormon mom has written, we seriously love our scriptures. I couldn't resist putting that one in there from the Mormon mom. The more we are captivated by them, the harder we try to hold on to the Bible's truths and to personalize them. At the same time, the more we do that, the more we seem captive to its powers of transformation. Thank you.